record this session. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, sorry for that snafu. Uh, I, I don't know when that option was turned off and somehow uh, all my Zoom uh, sessions were not recorded. Uh, you know, I was not teaching for the last quarter, so I didn't realize that that was turned off. Anyways, all right. Uh, so I was talking about uh, my research. So I I worked on uh, inter like you know building software defined networks for interdomain uh, exchanges (IXPs), and uh, that was one critical work which was kind of like building block for a lot of what followed. And recent years, uh, uh, as we will cover in this course, what has been a very trending topic in networking is about uh, network monitoring or telemetry in which you can extract a lot of information about the current state of the network. So I built a system called Sonata, which is also a building block for a lot of systems these days, uh, which basically focuses on enabling packet level streaming telemetry for networks. So this is kind of like my background. Uh, my current research is also focusing on a lot of these topics. So I'm very excited about teaching this course. And that is one reason I modulated what we had earlier, which was just focusing on socket programming and you know some web applications to focus more on this very trending topic uh, in networking, which is programmable networks. Uh, the two teaching assistants, Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay is my PhD student, so he's working on some projects where he is using software-defined networking to improve the quality of experience for video streaming sessions. And Jama is uh, is a first year PhD student. He is also working with me. Uh, he's, he's a PhD student with Elizabeth Belding, uh, who was your instructor for 176A, uh, but GMO and I are working together on a couple of projects together on network measurements. So uh, what are the goals for this course, right? So in terms of knowledge, uh, I want uh, at the end of this course that you should be very clear about what software defined networking really means, right? And there are so many definitions and so many ways and abstractions in which one can interpret what software defined networking means. So I want to make sure that I empower you with the right tools and settings so that you can reason about what is software defined networking, what is not software defined networking, and how. Uh, and then, like once we once we have knowledge of that, then we uh, also want to understand that what was the story behind software defined networking? Why did it became a very critical topic? Uh, what what motivated it, and what were the building blocks that enabled its realization? And also we will be contemplating on what are the current and future trends, right? So we will be doing some predictions at the end of this course, which is like, okay, what will network look like five years from now, 10 years from now? What will be hot? What will not be hot? And, uh, you know, like what will be the course of networking research in general? So that will be the goal uh, in terms of knowledge. And in terms of skills, uh, we will be focusing a lot on reading research papers. So that is one skill that I will you know, expect that you will be developing over time in this course. Uh, of course, it's a very broad skill. So we will be focusing more on how you read systems papers or how will you read networking papers and like, you know, not say machine learning papers. Uh, other than that, uh, you will also be uh, you know, working on programming assignments that will enable you to you know, have this skill set of developing applications, especially the ones that leverage programmable networks. And uh, one term long project will be focusing on using all uh, the you know, programming skills that you will be developing in this course uh, to reproduce some of the networking research results. So in terms of workload and evaluation, uh, we will have this uh, review form structure where you will be reading uh, some research papers uh, for every lecture, and then you'll be expected to submit a review form. Uh, it need not be very detailed, you know, like it will be very structured in terms of what uh, questions you need to explore from the paper. So, uh, you know, it, it will take time, but it will not take time as if you have to review it very critically, right? Like, so I would expect you to read a bit deeply, but at the same time, it's uh, not to a level where you have to reproduce those results, right? So for the term project that you'll be working on, uh, you for whichever paper you're going to reproduce, you will be working it to a level where you will be able to reproduce whatever has been done in that paper. So that is not the level of depth that I expect from the review forms that we will be doing, but to understand the high level idea, key ideas, how the evaluation work and all those things, right? So I will, I will give you, uh, uh, you know, like structure and framework in which we can work. Uh, but that is 
going to be a critical part uh, of this course evaluation because that will be the 30 percent and uh, you know uh, you should expect to submit at least one review per week right and there might be weeks in which you might be submitting two reviews right uh, in terms of programming assignments uh, we will have two programming assignments uh, 15 percent each uh, there will be assignment zero, which will be just setting up your environment. But uh, the first programming assignment will be uh, using, uh, you know, emulated network environment plus programmable switches to perform network monitoring. And the second will be uh, building up on the first assignment and then using the information that you have collected in the first iteration and use that in the next one to control or to optimize the quality experience for certain applications, right? So uh, our TAs are, uh, you know, in the process of finalizing the programming assignments and releasing them on time. Uh, so, you know, uh, we will have the assignment zero released uh, by early next week, where you will be setting up the environment. And then in next couple of weeks, you should expect to get, uh, get the programming assignment one, uh, which will be focusing more on this building stuff, right? And one of the most critical uh, piece here is the project, which will be, uh, you know, term long project here. I'll talk a bit more about uh, what the structure is going to be, but it will have these three different deliverables in terms of, uh, you know, intermediate into final progress report, as well as uh, it will be evaluated based on the quality of experimental setup and results, as well as the final presentation. So let me try to unpack this a bit more. Uh, so, uh, like our lectures, most of them will be asynchronous because I heard from a lot of you who were, you know, having issues uh, attending the synchronous lectures. I understand that. Uh, so most of the lectures will be asynchronous, but uh, I will be there for the office hours every week. So, you know, if there are any follow ups and like, you know, if any type of uh, discussion that you want to do with me, I'll always be available for the office hours and I'll encourage you to participate on those office hours. Right. And each lecture will cover one or two research paper. Um, like out of that one of one of them might be a required reading that you have to submit the review form for. And uh, for the paper that is recommended or like, you know, uh, required uh, for some submitting the review form, uh, we will provide you a review form to fill that out. And it is expected that you fill that out before the class, right? So we, we, like this, this say, for example, this week, you don't have any uh, review forms to submit, but we'll get, get started, you know, like next week, maybe one, then week after maybe two, things like that. So we'll make some slow progression so that you're able to understand and make progress slowly here. But uh, th yes. So we submit one paper per week or one every At least class. one paper per week. Okay. Yeah. So there will be weeks where you might be required to submit to. But I'll try to, you know, like structure the workload so that it's not too overwhelming for you all. But the key message here is that reading research papers is going to be a critical part uh, of this course. And the reason why we are doing this is because we are, we are covering something which is uh, very cutting edge. And uh, like there is no textbook that actually does a good job uh, capturing software defined networking, right? So uh, it is very important from that perspective that we read these research papers to understand what's going on. And it is my job to make sure that you understand the content of these papers. Uh, so I don't expect you right away that, you know, you I give you a paper and you are like, you know, 100% sure about what, what all is written in there. Uh, so, you know, in this, in this course, we will be going through the process where, you know, I will be preparing you to uh, identify what needs to be read in a paper, what is important, uh, how do you, you know, like uh, divide your focus and how do you approach a particular reading or research paper. So that is part of the course structure itself and the learning outcome as well. So, uh, but at the same time, you should expect to read a lot of papers in this course. And think of that as a replacement for your textbook. So uh, as I said, like, you know, review forms will provide you the link uh, on the course website and uh, we'll try to make it as bug free as possible. Uh, but, you know, like for what it's worth, I would like to mention that this is the first time we're offering this course and, uh, you know, whatever content you saw on the page, it took a lot of time and effort to create that. So I, I won't claim that there will be no mistakes in the future. There, there can be mistakes in the future. And I will appreciate if you can, you know, like, uh, uh, let me know on time so that others can benefit from it. And we have Slack for all these discussions. So, you know, the input as well as the reactions can be quite real time here. Uh, in terms of what to expect in the review forms, you know, uh, like 
uh, what I have here is a sample of questions. These questions can evolve uh, over time, depending on what paper we are reading and when we are reading it. So things will be relatively simpler in the earlier parts uh, part of this course when we are just getting started. But then I think as we move forward and as we try to understand, like you know, develop skills, how to focus on reading papers, then we'll be asking more in-depth questions for certain set of papers, right? But uh, at a high level, we'll be focusing on you know what is the key problem that this paper is trying to solve. What is the key idea that it is trying to apply to solve a particular problem? And then what is the metric of success uh, that it is using to demonstrate that a particular idea works or it doesn't work? And then what was the experimental setup that they developed to evaluate the key ideas? Right. So this is just a sample. I think these questions can vary depending on the paper, as I said. Uh, as I mentioned briefly about the programming assignments, uh, there will be three of them, but like, you know, zero is not graded. So, uh, you know, you don't have to worry too much about it, but it is also uh, critical for the other assignments. So you will have to do it, uh, but it will not be graded. Uh, the good thing about these assignments are, is that this is all brand new. And again, I, as I have to admit that we, we are doing this for the first time. So there will be uh, some, you know, uh, issues here and there. Uh, so we are all here to work together and, you know, make sure that these issues are getting resolved on time. Uh, but at the same time, I will appreciate if you folks can put some, you know, keep some patience here. Uh, we do, will be doing our best to make it as bug free as possible. But because we are doing it for the first time, so I would expect some bugs uh, or some, you know, uh, issues uh, over time here. But Good thing is that these assignments will be building up on each other. So, you know, the assignment zero will be setting up the environment, then the assignment one will be setting up a topology, will be running an experiment, will be measuring something, then we will be developing these new features that, that can extract information from the network, and we'll be building a collector where all this information will get collected. And then the assignment two will be building up on the first assignment where uh, we will use the information that we are collecting uh, from the first assignment to make some decisions about how to do, you know, or how to make forwarding decisions in the network, right? So uh, this will be a good uh, closing the loop type of uh, assignment section that we will have in this process. You will be learning uh, what type of tools one can use to, you know, like uh, create different type of experimental setups. Uh, how, uh, like, you know, what is what should be the workflow for uh, capturing the measurements or like, you know, extracting insights from the network, and then, you know, what workflow will uh, you know, any network operator will follow to close the loop in which it is first detecting something or, you know, observing something in the network and then reacting to those observations, right? So this is typically how uh, network operators, especially the network operators in, you know, some advanced networks, not, not really uh, trivial ones, but think, think of like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, these are the type of problems, like maybe not exactly this problem, but these are the type of problems that they work on. Uh, they're trying to build these pipelines of like, you know, collecting uh, different type of telemetry data from the network and then uh, making decisions based on that. So with these programming assignments, uh, our goal is that we will prepare you uh, to, you know, like understand the nuances of how, how these pipelines are developed and how can you, you know, like, uh, apply the broader set of skills that you will be learning in this course uh, into some uh, software programs that will enable uh, data collection as well as uh, making some real-time decisions, right? So uh, as I mentioned about the project, uh, this, is, uh, this is something which is also new, uh, where uh, the goal will be that uh, you will be reading, uh, you know, you will be selecting a bunch of research papers that you want to focus on, and then your goal will be to use the uh, emulated environments, uh, something which is feasible within your laptop to reproduce the results from those research, networking research papers, right? And I know that this might sound very scary, uh, but trust me, this is all doable. And as we will learn in this course that uh, the good thing about the networking research area in past few days, or oh, sorry, past few years has been that uh, we have developed a lot of tools and techniques that enable us to emulate different type of networking problems just on your laptop, right? So uh, we will be, you know, like exposing you to all uh, the process and, you know, we will, in the discussion sections, we will be providing you more tools uh, that you can use uh, so that you are, you know, uh, building up your skill set. Uh, and we will also be preparing you to, you know, like how to identify a research paper, how to identify uh, the problems and uh, the underlying problems and like, you know, think about the experimental setup and think about given the set of tools that you have, how will you enable or how will you emulate those experimental setups? I think that that's something that we will learn in this course. And this project, uh, the term the term long project that we will have will be kind of like, you know, the, uh, the epitome of our application of our skills where we will be, all the skills that we have learned 
in terms of the programming assignment, which is the software development in, the, in this uh, programmable network context, as well as the scale of the reading research papers, that's those two set of skills will be combined together and will culminate in this research project where you will be uh, reproducing some networking research results, right? And uh, like, you know, this is a bit open-ended in a sense that, uh, that if you don't want to reproduce research results and you want to do something of your own, which is original, uh, you have full freedom to do that as well. And, uh, you know, like uh, on the project website uh, or the project site uh, portion of this website, uh, we have provided more details about the de like the nuances of how exactly uh, this whole process will work. I will encourage you to take a look. If you have questions, you know, reach out to us. We'll, we are more than happy to clarify that. But for what it's worth, this has been, uh, you know, this is an idea uh, which was, say, uh, you know, uh, explored since 2012, 2011. Uh, when uh, this new uh, emulation network called Mininet was developed. So when Mininet was developed, the key idea behind that was like, hey, we should be able to reproduce uh, networking research results, right? So uh, at Stanford, there has been a course that has been offered for graduate students called CS244. And uh, they have been, uh, you know, uh, doing exploration on this uh, aspect where they're using these emulation tools to reproduce networking research results. Uh, I think like, you know, uh, like given that we have already taken 176a given that we'll be learning how to read research papers and how to develop uh, software applications for programmable networks i think we are um, you know we will be getting ready and we'll be getting prepared for how to do this type of project right but if you have any concerns and questions you know you should always feel free to reach out to me uh, either on the public uh, channels where, which everybody can see or if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation you know you should be feel, feeling free to reach out to me over private channels as well okay all right, so uh, before we get into uh, what software defined networking is, let, let me give you a quick primer on how to read research papers. And uh, you know, this is set of principles, but I think we like in the in the course of this uh, or the you know duration of this course, we'll be learning how to apply these skills. Uh, but I just want to give you a framework that people have been applying in terms of reading, especially the systems and networking paper, right? So uh, we have been reading stuff for you know past uh, few decades i guess you know like uh, depending on how old you are maybe just two decades uh, but uh, reading has been an essential skill you know like right from the elementary school timing we, we all we all are reading but it all depends how you read right and what you read so like you know like what is the expectation are you reading a novel or are you reading research papers those are two very different tasks right so you like we, we might think that there is a lot that we already know but there are certain set of skill set that are required to read research papers so S. Keshev, who is actually a professor in networking area, uh, uh, I believe he's in Waterloo, and he wrote this uh, research paper, which is uh, listed on the course website as well, which was, uh, you know, like this, this topic was how to read systems research papers, right? And he proposed this three-pass approach. The step one is a 10-minute scan to get the general idea, right? So, uh, or at a very high level, whenever you get a research paper, you should never read it linearly, right? You should not start from line one and all the way to till the last line or last sentence, right? That's not how it works. You have to first skim the paper in a non-linear fashion. The first thing that you should be looking into will should be like the first thing that is that you should look into is is the title of the paper itself, right? Uh, from the title, you in a, this is especially uh, applicable when you are deciding whether you want to read a paper or not. But in this course, we already have a list of papers. So, you know, like for those papers, you probably don't have to worry about reading the title and making some decisions. But for the project, you might want to, you know, skim a lot of papers and make, decide whether you want to use them for your project or not. So that this skill will, will be applicable in that context. So. Uh, you know, like from the title, you understand what's the high level, you know, theme of the paper. Abstract gives you a very succinct summary of what this uh, paper is all about or what is the key idea and what are the key results as well, right? And uh, introduction is something which is also a good uh, primer on like what this paper is all about. But like introduction is a bit more detailed than the abstract because it provides a bit more background for us to understand or contextualize uh, what is this problem, in what context it is getting applied, what is the key idea, and then how is this key idea applied and like, you know, what type of results are uh, extracted from using those ideas, right? And then uh, in this 10 minute scan, you should be just reading the sections and subsections, right? Like the titles of subsections and sections, right? So that will give you what is the flow and structure of the paper, or like, you know, how has this 
line of argument being made. So typically what you would expect to see is that, you know, introduction, then you'll see some background. Background sections are very important if you don't have a good background on that topic. And then, you know, like, then there might be some questions or sections on this design choices. So what type of design choices did the paper make? And then, you know, like, then there will be evaluation section. The evaluation section will provide you some insight on what type of data set they're using, what type of experimental setup that they're using. And then uh, a good evaluation section will lay out the set of questions that it is trying to answer. And then one by one, it will try to answer those questions with the experimental results, right? So this is typically what you would expect in a systems paper. So just reading those section and subsection titles gives you a sense of like the overall flow and story of the paper, right? And uh, conclusion is good, uh, is important because, you know, once you read the abstract and then you read the conclusion, uh, those two combined together is a very good summary of like, okay, how we started and where we ended up. Uh, so that is also a very good thing and it doesn't take a lot of time. Typically, a conclusion is, you know, maybe five, seven sentences. So that's not much to read, but it gives you a very good sense of like, what has this paper achieved, right? And then I think, uh, sorry. Uh, then the, like, you know, what to learn is these five C's that what type of paper is it with this just 10 minute scan, right? So what type of paper it is, what body of work does it relate to? Uh, does the assumption seems valid? What are the main research contributions? And is the paper well written, right? So paper well written is something which is subjective, but typically there is like the type of paper that we will read, most of them will be very well written papers. So that will, that way you will learn, uh, or at least you will be, uh, you know, like getting this uh, selective samples of uh, really good, well-written papers, but there are some poorly written papers. Uh, they, most of the time they don't make through the peer review system. So you probably don't see them a lot, uh, but uh, some good papers are poorly written as well, uh, but they do get accepted because they are, you know, like really good papers, right? But that's not very common. And once you have done this 10 minute scan, then you can decide whether you want to read further and like how much time you want to spend on that paper, right? So the next step will be a more careful one hour reading. And I would say that, you know, for the review forms, this is where I would expect you to stop, right? So maybe it will not be really one hour. It will be, uh, it will start with two hours and over time it will converge to one hour. Uh, but, you know, for when you're writing these review forms, this is the level of detail that I would expect you to go to where you will be reading with greater care. Uh, but you know you can ignore the details like proofs and all those things, and you can you can focus on what figures they have provided, what illustrations they are using, and what is the key line of argument that they are making, right? And uh, you can also you know mark some relevant references that you want to follow up, and maybe do a 10 minute scan, like not the full paper read, but just 10 minute scan of some of the references that will be useful for you to understand this current paper itself, right? And uh, you know, you should be able to grasp the content of the paper. So you should be able to summarize the main idea. You know, that is something which will be asked in most of the review forms in this course as well. And you should be able to identify whether you can or, you know, should fully understand uh, the key ideas in the paper, right? So sometimes, uh, you know, like maybe should is not really applicable because, you know, for at least for the review form, the type of papers that we'll be reading. So you should fully understand the key ideas. Uh, if you don't, then you know, like uh, you should let us know, and then we will we will try to amplify some aspects of the paper that are not clear with the first reading. Right, and the third point, uh, which is generally applicable but maybe not applicable for what you're trying to do, is that you can abandon reading in greater depth uh, if you don't really find it convincing after that careful read. Right, and uh, maybe you want to you like you know you read the this one hour summary and you basically get a sense that you don't have the enough background, so you maybe want to mark some of the references and uh, read that reference material before coming back to this paper, right? And uh, the third pass is only applicable for the project uh, part of this course where you will be, you know, like reproducing some research results from the papers. Uh, the third step is only applicable there. So you should apply those first, first two step filter when you're trying to select the paper that you would like to use for the project, right? But once you have made some decision that, okay, this is a good paper, I want to really understand how things are done, then, it might take several hours of virtual re-implementation of the work, right? So what is virtual re-implementation? So in virtual re-implementation, you make some, uh, you know, like making the same assumptions that the paper had, you try to recreate the work, uh, you know, maybe on a, on a paper, right? So uh, like in a sense that you don't really implement the system, but you virtually re-implement it in a sense that, you know, like you try to put some assumptions in place, try to see, okay, like, you know, if I have this setup, 
uh, is it really feasible is it not really feasible what type of challenges will i face uh, what type of experimental setup do will i need uh, for this type of reimplementation and like you know whether i have uh, whether i know how to uh, set up those experiments if not then what are the what are the gaps there right and uh, like uh, this is a general point but like when should you real, really uh, carefully read some papers uh, so you know this is something that i do uh, a lot when i'm reviewing papers for conferences or giving colleagues uh, giving feedback to my colleagues uh, but i think like you know this is something which is relevant for you folks and that's why i have this point up here which is uh, that if you're trying to reproduce uh, research results from a paper you have to really read it and like you know you have to virtually reimplement in your head uh, that how exactly this paper can be reimplemented and then once you have that you can lay out the strategy of like how you will go with the reproducibility aspect of things right? so so this will be the key part uh, of the papers and like you know then there are some other reading tri trips which you can uh, you know f follow later but at a high level you know like reading papers uh, can take a lot of cognitive energy uh, from you right so it can it can be a good uh, you know like uh, you know like uh, expense for, for your energy and uh, the you know the time that you have so you might want to plan ahead of time when you want to read these research papers you probably don't want to do it at the middle of the night uh, when you're not fresh and uh, you know uh, sleepy but uh, you know i think like these these are some basic uh, good advices but you don't have to follow them right but uh, like if you do it right uh, things will be easier uh, but you know like if you're not fresh I, I, like i don't read papers when i'm very not very fresh or tired uh, because uh, it gets very taxing for me to read research papers uh, they they're typically just 10 pages but those 10 pages is a lot of uh, information that is very compactly presented so it takes a lot of energy mental energy to unpack that information so from that perspective, uh, I don't do it. I won't recommend you to read it at odd hours, right? All right. So now we can move to this question of what is software-defined networking once we have, you know, like uh, covered the overview of this course. But before we move to this technical uh, topic, maybe uh, some of you have some questions about uh, the course, Any anything that was unclear, we can chat so about it now. The final project, it is a one-person one project, not a teamwork project right so it is a team project uh, and uh, this is something which uh, you know i heard from you folks when i was looking at the survey form that some of you are concerned about uh, doing group projects uh, technically uh, doing it alone is possible i don't i won't discourage it but at the same time it can be a lot of work so uh, my suggestion is like in an ideal world when we were all meeting everybody in person you know this would have been much much easier thing to do uh, this is still, you know, like up to you whether you want to do it in a in a group or you want to do it individually. I have no problems either way. Uh, and if you're doing it alone, then we can, you know, like calibrate the expectations in terms of what all a single person can achieve, and you know those projects will be judged accordingly. Uh, but I would I would see that, or I would recommend that, you know, if possible, you should try to find at least one uh, person to work with, or at least work in a team of two. Uh, but you know, you can all make your decisions here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, concerns? All right. So, uh, so we have learned a bit about software defined networking, right? So in 176A, you did cover the topic of uh, software defined networking. So anybody uh, wants to take a pass on, uh, you know, like sharing with us what they think uh, is a software defined networking. Or, or what we can do is that we can go for a quick breakout room and you know like you can all discuss that in uh, in small groups and then we can have some discussions uh, in next maybe we can take a breakout like we can go to breakout room for five minutes does that sound good okay all right so let me figure out how that works <laughs> Breakout rooms. All right. I will create. How many of us are here? 30, 40. So let's do eight breakout rooms.
<laughs> I wanted to, no, I did not like our the teacher last quarter. Jesus. Yeah. I I like tuned out the last half of the class, so I need to catch up on that. So Dude, yeah, that that was tough, bro. Yeah, the last half is yeah, stupid. Oh my god. Okay, I, know, like, I didn't even watch the lectures like, after like after the midterm. I think that is. Does this room automatically end or what happens now? I think the professor's probably gonna like uh, call us back at the end of it. Okay. Are we back? 
Yep, everyone's back. Uh, professor, are you there? Are you muted? Okay. Okay, the professor's muted. It looks like you're talking, but I can't hear a single thing. Me neither. Um, it says you're unmuted on Zoom too, so I'm not sure what the issue is. Hello? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I was just saying what all can go wrong is going wrong today. So, you know, uh, this is how we learn fault tolerance. <laughs> all right, let me share my screen again. All right, uh, can you folks see my screen? Yes, yes. All right, perfect. So uh, anybody from the breakout room, like, you know, wants to summarize the discussion in your group? I hopped on a couple of groups. So I didn't see a lot of discussion going on. Uh, so I'm hoping just, you know, like maybe some of you were having some good discussions on what is SDN. Anybody? None of the people in our breakout room really knew or had ever heard of a STN. Okay, so okay, that's that's one group. Any other group had heard of STN? Uh, our group didn't know what STN meant either, but uh, I believe it's a piece of software that has to do solely with uh, computer networking, right? Is that correct? We will know soon. <laughs> Any other group? Um, is it like when you have the software that controls like the, the flow, the network instead of like um, hardware? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's one answer, yes. Anybody else? Uh, like dynamic network topology uh, defined in software. Okay, that's one answer, yes. Uh, anybody else? All right, I, th I think like we have some good diversity of answers and uh, my expectation was that uh, it was briefly covered in 176A, so that's why I kind of like, you know, pushed you all to the breakout rooms, but it seems like it was not. Uh, so let me try to, you know, uh, cover that because that's what we are going to focus in this quarter a lot. Uh, so this is an abstract view of what software defined networking is. And I, I, I would say like, you know, almost all the answers that you folks gave are all correct, uh, more or less. So uh, what is software defined networking? It is a separation of data plane and control plane for networks, right? And you now, now you might be wondering what is data plane, what is control plane? And we will cover that as well. Uh, but you know, control plane is the plane that makes the decisions and the data plane, like you know, control plane makes a holistic decision about what needs to be done. And the data plane is the one that executes that decision at the packet level, right? So this is one way of looking at what is control plane and data plane. And we will have a full lecture uh, covering this data plane and control plane separation in more detail. Uh, but think about it uh, in a way that, you know, like from software defined networking perspective, what we expect to see is that we expect to see uh, dumb devices or dumb switches that should be there in the network whose job is to just forward the packets, right? So who basically look at the packet and make decisions about where it should go. Uh, they provide an open interface uh, to the upper layer or some network operating system uh, that communicates these decisions or like, you know, caches those decisions in these dumb devices. And then the network operating system has a bunch of control programs uh, which operate on this global view of the entire network and then make decisions on that, you know, whatever view that they're seeing, right? So now I can sense that this might get a bit confusing for you. 
So uh, let me try to unpack this a bit more. Uh, compared to what we had in the past, where both the decision of how to handle a particular packet and how to make these holistic network decisions or control decisions was, you know, like uh, matched or packed in just one device, right? So rather than making all those distributed, uh, you know, decisions, now we have this uh, paradigm or uh, framework where the the control plane and the data plane are completely separate from each other, right? And, and we'll try to cover these topics in more detail as we move forward. But for now, uh, what is software-defined networking? It is a separation of control plane and data plane, right? It is as simple as that. So I talked about network operating system. Uh, network operating system is a distributed system that creates a consistent and up-to-date view of what the network is. It runs on servers. Uh, uh, you know, you can also call them controllers in the network. And uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, those uh, operating systems, Knox, Onyx, Trema, Beacon, Mastro. And these are relatively old names. There is a one which is very popular, uh, which is not mentioned here. It's called ONOS, ONOS. So uh, it is a, uh, you know, open network operating system. It is developed by Open Networking Foundation. And what that Open Networking Foundation is, we'll cover very soon. Uh, but, you know, at a high level, network operating system is the one that interfaces uh, these switches as as devices and you know provide these interfaces or like you know, you leverages these uh, interfaces that communicate between these devices in the operating system uh, the operating system extracts information from these devices to you know create a network wide view and then you have these control uh, programs that run on that operate on that view right so as i mentioned like you know it uses this forwarding abstraction to get the state from the forwarding elements or the switches and then it sends some control instructions to these forwarding elements. Right? So I mentioned control program. In that uh, control program operates on the view of the network. So it has some input, uh, which is the global network view, or you know, think of that as a graph. And then it outputs, which is the configuration or the specific decisions that needs to be sent to individual network device. And the control program is not a distributed system. So uh, the network operating system can be uh, a distributed system uh, where you know like you can have multiple instances of the operating system but the control program is operating on a centralized view and that is very critical right so uh, the like it, when we when in 176a if you probably write some uh, routing protocols like ospf so they spend a lot of time and energy uh, you know maintaining uh, this consistent state across all these devices so that they can make the forwarding decisions uh, but like all the complexity is because they're trying to, uh, you know, like maintain this consistent state. But like if this state is maintained uh, centrally, then you don't have to worry about that those consistency issues. And whatever decisions you will make once you have the consistent view of the network are the only things that the control programs have to worry about. Right? So what is forwarding abstraction? Uh, the forwarding abstraction is uh, the one that abstracts away the forwarding hardware, right? So it decouples the forwarding decision from the hardware that is making those forwarding decisions. Uh, it is flexible because its behavior is specified by the control plane, uh, the control programs that we were talking about, and it is uh, built from basics that are forwarding primitives, right? So forwarding primitive can be that, okay, send this to a particular port or drop this packet, or maybe, uh, you know, like uh, send this to another queue or something, right? So these are the decisions of the, uh, the forwarding primitives that it is based on. And uh, it's kind of like minimal that it is uh, streamlined for speed and low power. Uh, when I say speed, uh, which is the time it takes to uh, handle a particular packet in a device. So it is streamlined for that. And also like that naturally translates to the low power consumption. Uh, the control program is not vendor specific, right? So you can have different set of uh, devices from different vendors. And as long as you have the right abstractions and interfaces between these devices and the control program, the control program need not worry about, hey, this is like, you know, device from vendor A or vendor B, right? Or Cisco, Juniper, these are the vendors. So OpenFlow is an example of such an abstraction, right? So OpenFlow uh, is uh, one instantiation of how software-defined networking can be enabled, and uh, it leverages this forwarding abstraction. So like now I will take a step back. You know, we have covered what software defined networking is. Uh, it is a separation of control plane and the data plane. And uh, 
like it has these three uh, key components when one is the forwarding elements which you can think of the dumped switches and then it has a network operating system uh, that communicates with these devices to uh, you know create a consistent view of the network and then we have control programs that operate on this uh, you know network view or the global network view think of that as a graph right so this is what software defined networking is uh, in a nutshell uh, but i will take a step back now and try to talk about what, what, what was the initial motivation for software defined networking right so the extreme thought experiment that started at stanford uh, was uh, what if a software decides whether to accept each flow and how to route it right uh, take an example where you have this enterprise network where you have bunch of switches ethernet switches and you have different hosts right and you want to uh you know make decisions about uh, the the routing path that is being taken by the traffic from host a to host b right and uh, when the traffic arrives then you know they whenever the first packet is coming in that goes to some controller and then that controller decides that whether uh, there should this communication should be allowed and if this communication should be allowed what type of routing path should it take right so uh like you know like so you know like it is uh, reading some information from this forwarding element and then making decisions and then it is you know pushing those forwarding decisions to these uh, ethernet switches right and then the traffic can uh, go through uh, this part of the network right so a decision can be that you know host a and b should not communicate with each other so whenever host is trying to reach out to host b the controller can decide okay like this is not or this is against a particular policy so then it can push rules that, that will drop the packet at the first switch itself right so that is a possibility so this is this was the basic idea of a research paper called ethan and uh, we won't be covering that paper in detail but you know like this is one key idea that whenever a first packet is coming in it goes to a controller the controller checks the policy that needs to be applied you know you can think of that any type of uh, you know graph uh, or, or database that is uh, out there which you know like does a query on like whether host a and host b can communicate with each other if the decision is yes then it will try to apply some optimized uh, uh, policy of like what type of rules should be placed on each of those forwarding elements such that a and b can talk to each other if the decision is that they should not be talking to each other then it can push a rule say like okay deny the communication just drop the package right so that was the key idea that ethan was exploring and the goal was that uh, you know they want to enable a lot of flexible set of policies uh, but uh, enabling that with these uh, ethernet switches was very very complicated using the existing set of control programs to enable that was very very uh, complicated as well or complex as well so that's why they came up with this idea and this idea led to a question that okay you know uh, how many just 400 dollars worth of servers do we need if we have an enterprise network with 35000 users right that was that was a fundamental question that uh, was asked and the answer was that you know all that can actually be handled with just one server right or or not even like you will be under utilizing even a 400 dollar server in that case right so that is actually a very uh, eye opening uh, answer because that translates to a lot of things right so if it is possible to make such centralized decisions for network the consensus is that we will right because Uh, the cost of uh, building such distributed systems that we already have for routing uh, think of ospf and other routing protocols that we have learned in 176a all these routing protocols focus on like you know maintaining consistency with each other right so sharing information that, like you know all the protocols that you covered for routing were talking about how this uh, consistency of state can be enabled what type of information should a particular router should advertise to its neighbor so that like both of them have the same view of the network right so all those efforts of uh, distributed state operations were very very complex uh, they slow the innovation and that was the key idea that you know if it is possible to avoid all that and make these decisions centrally and if we can do this with just a 400 dollar server for 35000 users uh that tells you a lot that you know like these questions or like this type of approach can be taken such a centralized decision making can be enabled right so uh then once that question is out there then you know the other set of questions are like what might we want to control them centrally or oh, sorry why might we we might want to control them centrally right like is it cost is it control is it 
innovation flexibility what what is the fundamental reason why that should be done and then how does this compare to the networks uh, that are controlled today right and this is a question that was framed in say 2007 to 2008 and which which was in some sense genesis of the software defined networking that you know do we really need to control them centrally if yes then how and uh, like how does that compare to what we have right now right so those were the two set of questions that were very critical and uh, like this is what the Ethan uh, idea was all about that typically the network was uh, packing both the control and data plane together. So you have packet forwarding, but also the routing protocols that were or the, the algorithms, the routing algorithms were all sitting on those same set of devices and they were just coordinating information with each other so that they can take packet from point A to point B, right? So Ethan's idea was that let's take all this control plane up and a remote control plane, create a remote control plane and enable those decisions, right? And as I was mentioning earlier, that if A should not be talking to B, that policy can be written in this remote control plane. And then, you know, the information transfer between these forwarding elements and the control plane can make sure that we can apply that policy or enforce that policy. Right. So this is like when I say the approach was starting elsewhere, this is reference to 2007, 2008 timeframe that this was an idea uh, that was, you know, get, gaining some traction irrespective of Ethan, right? So we should not give too much emphasis on what Ethan was or the thought process behind Ethan. Uh, the other uh, areas such as, you know, the public vans, uh, the AT&T and AT and backbone was also already thinking about how we can do separation of data plane and control plane. Uh, they were thinking within the bounds of the existing set of protocols so that like, you know, if they have already invested in, uh, you know, billions of routers within their infrastructure, so they didn't want to replace them. So given the capabilities of those routers itself, how they can enable a separation of control plane and data plane was the focus of at and uh, This is say 2004, 2005. And these are the papers that we will read uh, in this course that, you know, what was the thought process, what were the challenges, and how did they enable that control plane, data plane separation, uh, uh, like, you know, which was in some sense precursor for software defined networking, right? So this was already happening. Uh, companies like Meraki and CapMap were already there, which were which were already exploring how this type of disaggregation can be leveraged to implement these flexible policies at the enterprise level. And uh, for the cable network, also the, these new set of protocols called or specifications called DOCSIS were already there, which were focusing on separation of control plane and data plane separation. But very important, uh, disaggregation idea was gaining a lot of traction. Uh, in the data center network. So think about 2007 and 2008. Uh, this was a time when all these companies like uh, Google and Microsoft, they were worrying about the scalability problem, right? So they were, you know, like data centers was not relatively new, but I think the scale problem for data centers kind of like came around in 2004, 2005, six, seven time frame, where they were just, you know, buying servers, buying switches and trying to provide as much compute or trying to build as much compute power as possible. And then they had to worry about this networking problem that, okay, if you are running these four servers that need to coordinate with each other so that they can come finish the computation, you know, these distributed computations, so they have to interact with each other. So how, what type of uh, data center network should you be building such that uh, the cost of connecting all these devices is relatively low, right? So uh, these companies were already thinking about it. Uh, maybe we can uh, revisit this or like, you know, discuss this big, big data center issue uh, that was, uh, you know, dominating the debate around this framework of 2007-2008 about the cost. So, you know, like you have 500,000 servers that they were worrying about, right? So half a million servers we're talking about. And to connect all these half a million servers, uh, you know, there is a topology called CLOS. Uh, that we will briefly cover in this course as well. So, you know, given that topology for these many number of servers, you will require 25,000 switches, right? Which is a lot. But if you were going by the, uh, you know, the legacy switches that were available out there, then you will be paying around $10,000 per legacy switch, around $250 million of expense. And uh, then uh, 2,000 disaggregated switch will be $50 million. So overall, if you have five data centers, the savings will be $1 billion, right? So uh, like, I, I think like maybe uh, what I was trying to say just got uh, missed here, that if you were using the legacy devices, which were the switches, which had this bloated uh, software stack, 
which was making the forwarding decisions, but it was also have running all this complex control plane in the switch itself. So those devices require a lot more CPU, a uh, lot more power. So, you know, and, and because of those reasons, they were expensive. So uh, for those simple, uh, you know, requirements that you had in the data centers where you just wanted to, you know, forward traffic from port A to port B, uh, rather than spending $10,000 per switch, it was possible to use these disaggregated switch, which were just dumb switches that were applying these simple decisions about whatever traffic comes on port A goes to port B, or you know if it is uh, host A, then it should go to port two, port three, and stuff like that, right? So those switches uh, were very cheap, uh, two thousand dollars. So you know, like overall, you have five times reduction in cost, and that is just one data center. But if you you know talk about five data centers, then you're talking about uh, one billion dollars in savings, right? So uh, like it's not just the cost; it is also the control, right? So imagine that the problems that I was talking about that have, that these devices had to communicate with each other so that they have this consistent view of the network. Uh, you know, if you have to do that in the data center scale where you have 25,000 switches and uh, you know, like maybe some of them will be routers as well. So all this synchronization coordination effort that will be uh, a lot of overhead and a lot of chaos for data center networks that they don't really want, right? So they want this, uh, pr predictability in the network, and that is only possible when you have centralized control, right? So in general, the, the rule of thumb was that if you can, you should centralize. This, you should only go with the distributed solutions if you cannot centralize the problem, right? So it was kind of like, you know, no brainer. Uh, uh, like if you have the centralized control, then you can provide some customized network connection. You can differentiate the networks or the, uh, the connections from each other, and you can develop your own, own homegrown traffic engineering right, solution. So we will uh, cover uh, this question in, the, uh, in this class as well, but like we will be covering a solution that Google developed in 2013, uh, which was called B4, and that was for their wide area network not the data center, but for wide area networks. And they build their own homegrown traffic engineering solutions, which help them uh, achieve a very, very high utilization of their networks, right? So 50% utilization means that, you know, you're kind of like wasting half the resources that you've already invested in, right? So uh, this was a huge problem from both data center networks, from the wide area networks perspective that they were just wasting the amount of uh, devices that they were buying. And at the same time, you are know, like the capacity of those, like the, the volume of traffic that they have to carry is just increasing and they cannot just keep on buying these expensive devices all the time, right? So this was uh, the, the old model of networking was seeming through the burst, uh, bursting through the seam, sorry, uh, in this case. And I think, you know, this was a bit of an inevitable uh, revolution, evolution that was supposed to happen. It just happened in a more structured way that changed the networking area a lot uh, in the years to come. Right. So by 2008, Google and Amazon were already, you know, they started writing their own software. They uh, poached a lot of networking professors uh, from uh, different universities uh, so that, you know, like a lot of networking professors left their academia and joined these companies and led these research teams or, you know, dev teams that were developing all these software programs. Right. So that was a very exciting time, uh, uh, you know, like because of huge transformation of uh, of these companies or like you know these data center networks was going on and software defined networking was the uh, the primary tool that they all relied on uh, to scale things up right and this is an example from the data center perspective then we have the example from the isp perspective as well that over time the amount of traffic that these isps were carrying was increasing significantly over time but uh, the end customers uh, monthly bill didn't change, couldn't change from the for the competitive reasons. So you know it was very very critical for these networks to make sure that they're able to leverage the capital investments that they're making on these devices and maximize the usage or utilization of these devices. And that was only possible if you have centralized control of the network and you can program the, your traffic engineering solutions. You know, like you can write these traffic engineering applications that have this full control, centralized view, full control of the network. And that was uh, the only way to achieve that high level of utilization, right? So we will cover all those things in more details. Uh, I think uh, now we are, uh, you know,
coming towards the end of this lecture and for all the other snafus that we have in the course, we couldn't really cover all those things. And so whatever uh, we have not covered, we'll be covering in the next class. But before we leave, I just wanted to, uh, you know, like give you a preview of uh, what the routers look like before and what they uh, have transformed to now uh, from STN perspective. So in the older times, we a big internet router look like uh, this, where you know you have these uh, features that you are doing some routing management, some mobility management, some access controls, enabling virtual private networks. So these are all features that were running at the top of the operating system. Uh, this operating system had like you know millions of lines of source code, and then you had the custom hardware that was underlying uh, there. So those uh, hardware targets had billions of gates, you know, like those, those FPJ gates out there. So, uh, like you know, the these uh, operating systems are implementing uh, seven thousand different internet RFCs that were out there, and as a result, all these devices were very bloated, and they were very power hungry, right? So this was a huge challenge uh, that everybody was facing, especially from the ISP perspective, because the, the, they had these routers deployed. And these routers that I'm talking about, which the career grade, they were they are called career grade, which which means that you know these mobile carriers are kind of like using these routers. So these these were order of you know a few hundred thousand dollars or sometimes million dollars as well, right? So, uh, but then they were providing functionality that you don't really need, right? So you can disaggregate. When I say disaggregate, you are kind of like you know decoupling uh, the. Uh, the capabilities of functionalities where you're taking away the operating system or whatever can be done in software away from actual router to some remote uh, server, right? So that's a that's a disaggregation of resources or that's decoupling of resources that we're talking about. And that was a huge turning point because compute was cheap, but doing compute on a router was not cheap, right? So that was kind of like a no brainer if you think about it in retrospect, uh, but it was not so obvious when people were actually working on these things. All right. So uh, after Ethan, uh, you know, like people were thinking about, hey, what what's going to be the next step? Given that we have, you know, some proof of concept that we can make some centralized decisions, uh, companies like Microsoft were very very excited. They just, as I said, like you know, they started poaching professors and you know, like uh, uh, created huge uh, research groups. Uh, Microsoft Research has a very big networking research team, and they were like, okay, come on and let's do research together, right? And companies like Cisco. Uh, who were selling these million dollar devices were very nervous, right? They were like, oh, this, this is never going to work, right? And uh, this is when the community kind of like saw the raw nerve and they realized that we are up to something. If people are nervous, then it's always a good thing. Uh, so that kind of like uh, happened with STN. Uh, and rest of the story, I think uh, to put things in perspective, software defined networking has been a success story. Uh, there were a lot of skepticism when it started. Uh, but I think like, you know, it has uh, transformed the networking area significantly, but at the same time, we are still in the middle of the transformation that's going on. I think uh, whatever as a community we predicted, say 10 years ago, not all those goals have been achieved. And there is this one looming goal about, uh, you know, like making these networks independent enough that they can work or operate without human operators is a very uh, you know, desirable goal for network operators, but it has not been achieved. And like, you know, that's that's where we want to be, but we are not. And uh, that's why I'm saying like, you know, all these ideas that we envisioned are not really uh, realized or all of them are not uh, really realized. So there is a lot of gap uh, that is still exists. And that's something that we will also cover in the course. Uh, in the next class, I'll talk about uh, how software defined networking have enabled uh, extracting simplicity. And uh, rather than uh, trying to master complexity, that was the you know like the mode of operation for most network operators in the past, right? Uh, so I think uh, I hope this class gave you a perspective of uh, what all uh, we will be covering, and uh, you know like two takeaways from this class will be that you know uh, from knowledge perspective we will be learning about what SDN is and how it came uh, came into being, uh, what made it work, and how it can be applied. In skill uh, perspective, uh, you know, you'll be learning more about, uh, you know, like reading papers and how to write these software programs that can leverage the programmable networks, right? Uh, so in next class, as I said, like, you know, we'll be continuing from this discussion, but we will also be focusing on the history of software defined networking. And uh, from there, we will be building up on uh, these, some of the previous works and then bringing up to speed uh, in terms of uh, what is or how exactly software-defined networking is being used at companies like Google and Microsoft. All right, 
So before I leave, any questions for me? Uh, so professor, mm -hmm. this is Jerry. I sent you an email this yes. morning. I added to your Slack channel, but only using my email account. I cannot use my ussb.edu account. I need to that's, use- That's account. kind of weird because I have enabled that, that for, uh, you know, like uh, all UCSB dot, ucsb.edu, cs.ucsb.edu and email. So I don't know why that happened. I, I, I'll try to investigate that. Uh, but anybody else having issues joining Slack? I guess uh, no, but uh, you know, I, th I think like uh, Jerry, for what it's worth, when I sent you the invite, I actually use the email because that was uh, something on Gotcha Space. So maybe oh. that might be one reason why uh, you know, like uh, Slack is not letting you uh, uh, log in with some other email. Uh, but if you want, I can use your uh, ucsb.edu and like explicitly add that email ID. I think that should resolve that problem. Okay. And another question. So when we write our uh, re review for mm -hmm. our research papers, yes. we submit it. Where do we submit it? Yes. Yeah, so we will provide uh, a link uh, for submission. Uh, like basically we will be providing a Google form link that you will be, you know, like filling out and then it will like automatically get submitted there. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, anything else? All right. I think uh, thanks for all uh, coming to the lecture and uh, uh, most likely the next class will be uh, async, uh, but I'll try to see if, if I can, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, make those lectures available sooner so that you can go through what we wanted to like what I also wanted to cover for this class. And uh, I will be there for the uh, for the office hours. So if anybody wants to come in and you know have more discussions about SDM, I'll be more than happy to do that. I, right. I have a question. So, yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so when you say it's async, do you mean that there's going to be live lectures and those will be recorded or there's not going to be any more live lectures? So there will be live lectures, but I think like uh, may maybe the next one will not be live lecture, but you know, like uh, I will be sprinkling in uh, the combination of you know, live lectures and uh, like recorded lectures. So uh, like, like in general, I'm trying to make sure that uh, like things are more fair to students who will not be able to join. Uh, live. So uh, I will try to make these lectures, like, you know, record them and like you know, make them available sooner. And uh, for any follow up discussions, I'll be there for my office hours. So like, you know, if, if there is any follow up that we want to do from the lectures, uh, we can we can do that then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So how often do you want to do, to make the lectures asynchronized and synchronized? I, I would I would try that for as many lectures as possible. And you know, like the synchronous part will be about follow-up discussions that we can do, uh, you know, like during the office hours. Uh, so you know that that will be my goal. But you know, it is possible that I might not get time for recording lectures ahead of time. So you know, we we might be recording uh, during the lecture hours itself. But if I am able to do that uh, sooner, then the, the, I will be able to post those videos sooner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, so the office hours, mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't find any zoom links to the office hours and, and sections. Yeah, I think, I think they are on the website. Uh, okay, I'll find it. Yeah. I'll try. I, I, I'll make sure that they are, uh, you know, updated, uh, but most likely I, I, I remember updating them, uh, but I'll double check. All right. Other questions? All right, I, I will see you folks later. And you know, uh, feel free to use Slack if you have any questions for me or the teaching staff.